automatically um, when we use them, when we travel, or uh, when we travel around with them, and they're much more exposed to um, uh, in unauthorized access in various ways than um, than ever before. So I think one of the first things implicit in the um, FBI's arguments that we need to to push back on and, and be a little bit uh, uh, skeptical of is the idea that this is just about whether you trust law enforcement. Because the uh, ability for law enforcement to decrypt uh, things is also potentially an ability for a criminal or somebody who finds your phone or uh, a hostile nation state uh, to make use of the same backdoor functionality if they can get access to it, or uh, to a security flaw uh, introduced by the additional complexity. So, you know, anything that uh, allows for a second way into these devices that that we lose, that are online on the internet, that are exposed to um, uh, external attacks over the network that somebody might find and, and enter a passcode, anything that provides additional ways into those devices and anything that makes the security system on those devices more complex uh, greatly increases the risk that those security systems are going to fail when it's somebody other than the FBI trying to get in. So I think it's, it's um, you know, I, I, I don't want to allow this discussion to get framed as a question of whether or not, you know, the, uh, we should trust the government uh, with this capability or not. Because, uh, you know, that's a legitimate discussion to have and perhaps reasonable people can disagree on what the answer to that question uh, should be. But giving the government that capability, you know, carries with it some other costs. Um, and, and that's actually something I'm even more concerned about. So one more question for you, Julian, and then I'm going to see if any of you have questions, even though I have a, a whole list. Um, noting what Matt just said, what does the policy environment look like moving forward? What can we expect to see either in DC or Silicon Valley or globally that's responding to both the threat potentially from governments that we can disagree on or the threat from other actors um, who may have more malicious um, motivations. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say, you know, James Comey famously called very legislative, congressional, or regulatory fix um, to this problem of encryption and sort of sandwich that with their sort of long standing desire to re uh, require uh, uh, telecommunications providers to provide a kind of backdoor for communications in transit. So, there's the user end encryption of the, the, the data at rest stored on the device. Uh, and then, of course, there's also the live data, the data that is uh, routed through Skype or whatever, you know, WhatsApp or whatever other uh, communications uh, system you're using. Um, probably you know, a new one next week uh, that, that uh, will render all the old ones uncool. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, a, a capability to, uh, to intrude into those as well, which, of course, means that you can't um, fundamentally be using end-to-end uh, -end encryption where the key is generated by uh, the user's own device and negotiated between the two users, not between uh, them and a, a sort of centralized hub. Um, I, I don't know how likely it is that that's going to happen. Um, we saw basically again this same uh, this same fight in the mid 1990s uh, when uh, Sanity I think, won out. Um, in 1994, the Communications Distance for Law Enforcement Act required telephone carriers to architect their systems as they moved over to digital switching um, for uh, actually m a very large scale simultaneous so uh, access by law enforcement. So by the acronym, it's the, the CALEA. Right, CALEA, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, um, but explicitly excluded uh, from that any obligation uh, on the part of the carriers to provide the ability to intercept user end communications, user encrypted uh, communications. And I think that made a fair amount of sense. You can debate whether Khalid was a good idea, but it was fundamentally about regulating the architecture of a relatively small number of large and quasi-monopolistic carriers. Uh, moving this forward, you're talking on the one hand about, uh, at the platform level, 
uh, trying to impose a mandate on you know, thousands or tens of thousands of relatively small tech startups, many of which, by the way, of course, are not going to be inside the United States. Uh, and then on the other hand, when it comes to devices, uh, we are trying to regulate the architecture not of a central switching um, uh, apparatus controlled by the company, but of a device that has traditionally been at least substantially under the control of the user. And so this is actually a really difficult policy problem. Um, right, so traditionally, right, you buy a computer, maybe it comes loaded with Windows um, or Mac OS, but in general, the idea is uh, whatever software it comes with, the user it has, owns the machine, controls the machine, and can install different software on it if they want. You buy a ThinkPad, it comes with Windows, you decide, you know what, I want Linux instead, so I'm going to put that on it. And the, uh, you know, ultimately, if you want the manufacturer to guarantee that the device is not going to encrypt its contents in a way law enforcement has no back door for. Um, what you need to effectively do is outlaw Turing completeness, which if, uh, for those of you who are not computer science, it basically means right, prevent machines from running arbitrary code. Uh, make it impossible for a computer you have sold to a consumer to run the software that consumer wants. Because if it can run whatever software the consumer installs, then you cannot guarantee that that software is going to have the back door you need to access that, that would be a radical transformation in the way computers work and in the model of computing that has driven a lot of incredible innovation. You could not have something like Linux. You could not really have open source software if devices were designed to refuse to implement code that had not been authorized by some corporate body or some central authority that sort of has the keys to that device. So I think from a policy perspective, there's at least enough members of Congress who, who recognize this, that a, it's going to be very hard to push forward any policy that wouldn't be sort of uh, trivially ineffective because circumventable by the user um, or just it's catastrophic for innovation because it uh, puts a bullet in the head of the model that has driven uh, the innovation economy in this country and around the world. So I, wanna, I, wanna, no, I just want to add to the to, to two points, uh, amplify two points that you made. Um, one is, you know, the observation that this is, uh, we talked about this as, the, as about crypto, but it's actually about much more than crypto. And the, the, you know, Apple announcement was concerned with encryption on the end, end device. But if you look at what the FBI's complaint was, uh, you know, crypto happened to be the mechanism that they were concerned about in this case. But really what they said they want is the ability to mandate designs to allow for surveillance. And whether that means being able to uh, have a backdoor into the encryption mechanisms that are used, or whether that means they have backdoors into authentication um, systems that are used, or whether um, that means that data that uh, is going to be stored on your device has to be copied to somewhere else. That's going to vary depending on the particular application that the, that the government is concerned with. So, you know, this is not just narrowly about a small esoteric corner of, uh, of uh, you know, of, of technology and maybe, you know, cryptographers could come up with some, you know, magic uh, what was the golden magic keys. golden keys that uh, that could uh, um, um, that could accomplish this in some way that would really only let the government get into this encryption system? That won't work for a variety of reasons. But even if it did, this is actually about much more than that. So, um, and and the second thing is, I, I want to uh, emphasize not just the. Uh, threat to innovation, which is, you know, uh, which would be extraordinarily uh, serious if there were a, a design mandate that anything that handles data that law enforcement um, might want in the future has to be designed for law enforcement access. You know, the, you know the, uh, Julian described, you know, the burden that that would put on small startups and, you know, and, and the larger companies, and this is the the you know essentially a uh, a burden on precisely what allowed the internet to, to flourish in the way it did, but this is also going to create an enormous amount of risk because these 
design features that the FBI wants don't add any value to the end user. And something that doesn't add any value to the end user is not going to be the focus of the uh, design uh, and implementation scrutiny that any new product or piece of software gets. It's going to be implemented in the easiest way that can comply with the rules. The problem is, this is something, this functionality is absolutely central to the security of the entire device because it's essentially providing a second way of getting access to all the data on the device. So essentially, you know, this is a mandate um, to add a you know, feature that doesn't add any value to the customer uh, that has the potential to access any data that law enforcement might want, which coincidentally is any data that a criminal might want, um, any data that a hostile uh, nation state might want, or any data that you know a curious coworker or spouse or family member or what have you uh, might be interested in. So you know we're, we're we're if the FBI you know the FBI needs to be careful what it wishes for here because you know in trying to solve one type of crime um, or you know in trying to solve crimes involving data stored on these things they're opening the door for uh, you know a whole uh, flood of new crimes because our devices are going to be even weaker than they are now and more vulnerable than they are now. So, you know, I, I, I think if, if the FBI gets what it wants, it's going to be awfully busy investigating all of these new crimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep this conversation going, but I want to know if anybody out here has any questions to add. Yes, please. Right. Based on your comment just now, isn't there somebody in the administration of the FBI who speaks those words, but instead of you saying the FBI, they say we? Um, is, is there somebody philosophizing on if we do this, it's much bigger than crypto? Uh, yeah, actually, can I, can, can I feel that one? Because I, I, had, I won't know the name. I had a, a conversation with uh, a couple of years back <coughs> with a, a senior person in the Justice Department's security division. Um, and we actually had a kind of debate over the, the previous iteration of this um, argument. And he said, well, we need to get to that. And I kind of laid out the sort of quickie version of why I thought this was a bad idea and why um, such proposal had rightly foundered in the late 90s, and just said, yeah, okay, well, it sounds like maybe they haven't thought this out. Um, it's tyranny of the inbox. And I said, so what do you mean? He said, look, these are operational guys. Um, you know, I sort of, I, you know, I, I, I kind of almost wish we had someone kind of in a more think tanky role who could just sit back and say, what's the big picture? How does this mesh with uh, the general effect on innovation, the general user security? Uh, with our international attempts to promote uh, freedom, with uh, you know, the effects on uh, the global market, um, the, the competition in a global market for secure devices, with the effect of repressive foreign regimes that may also avail themselves uh, of these back doors, with when you know at least certainly at least when U.S. companies have uh, outposts in those countries, these are all considerations that are uh, certainly relevant. It's things you have to at least think about before you start uh, charging forward with a policy recommendation. But within these operational divisions, right, it's not their job to uh, stroke their chins and think about the big picture. Their job is to uh, to catch suspects, gather evidence, issue indictments, win prosecutions. Um, and so if that's your mandate, then what's coming into your inbox is, look, I'm trying to make a case. Uh, I can't solve this problem. Solve this problem for me. And so there's, you know, you look at the straight line answer. All right, let's require them to build in a mechanism by which we can circumvent uh, this encryption. Um, and, you know, it's understandable that that's what their priority is. They're a law enforcement uh, um, agent, agency, not a kind of, not, not a think tank. Um, but it does mean that we ought to uh, recognize that we're getting uh, a, a policy recommendation based on uh, very specific kind of short-term interests, I think, and not uh, uh, you know sort of adequate reflection on all the knock-on effects. So you said something that's very interesting. You said build it in, and one of the things that Comey said in his remarks is that he believes, and that he's not sure because he doesn't build these, that if backdoors are built into technology from the beginning. 
um, based on what you said earlier, Matt, about them being able to be used by other parties, mm -hmm. that he doesn't think that they can be used in that way. That maybe you could build something in that can only be accessed by law enforcement. Well, I guess I'm flattered by Director Comey's <laughs> um, um, uh, faith in my field, but um, uh, you know, I'm. Uh, so there, there are two issues. <coughs> um, the first is uh, there's the explicit um, backdoor uh, use. So any backdoor is going to be based uh, access to any backdoor, whether it's built in from the beginning or added added on at the end, is going to be based on. Um, you know, some secret somewhere that the government knows or has access to uh, for how to uh, for how to exercise the backdoor, and that might involve an encryption key, uh, or it might involve some some other mechanism. Uh, there's going to be have to be some secret, and it's going to have to be held somewhere, and that secret um, is going to have to have some set of safeguards and procedures built around it in order to um, uh, make sure that it's used only under authorized conditions with the court order by actual, uh, by the government, and that the secret doesn't get out. Um, you know, it's possible to protect certain secrets, uh, but it's extraordinarily expensive. And because we're talking about the full range of, you know, mobile device and, and computer platforms and applications that use them, um, uh, doing this, we're talking about thousands and tens of thousands and a growing over time number of these secrets uh, that are going to have to be protected in different places with different sets of operational procedures around them. You know, designing the security system, not just the, the software that runs on your device that's, uh, that allows this secret to, to, to get into it, but designing the security system for even one of these uh, um, uh, backdoors uh, operationally and um, uh, and uh, technically is a, ma a monumental security engineering task. And it's one that, again, as, as I mentioned, isn't actually adding any value to the customer. So um, we're talking about a, a, a huge uh, risk associated with the secret itself explicitly getting out or being misused uh, operationally. The second problem is a little bit um, um, subtler, but in fact, I think of the two, it's the more serious, which is that uh, you know it is it is perhaps not a great secret that my field, computer science, pretty much doesn't know what it's doing. Um, the, the computer security side of computer science in particular is the, the, um, the one aspect of computing that I am a little bit ashamed to say seems to be making negative progress over time. And everything gets worse. I see my colleagues in graphics and I see my colleagues in, in other fields doing these incredibly flashy, wonderful things. And what, I, what I'm doing is just saying, well, we've got another new problem to work on in my, in, in, uh, my field. We don't know, and this was the problem since the beginning of computing, we don't know how to build correct systems. We don't know how to build code that doesn't have bugs. And the larger a system is, uh, the more difficult it is. Um, you know, somewhere between um, a, a quadratic and exponentially harder as the size of the system increases, it becomes harder and harder to be sure that it's operating correctly. Um, when we add complexity to systems, uh, both the, uh, on the uh, um, protecting the secret side of the system and also making systems uh, have a backdoor um, on your device that cooperates with the device, we have to make sure that those systems operate 100% correctly in order to be sure that we haven't added not just the explicit backdoor, but some other weakness and vulnerability. The same reason that Microsoft every month has Patch Tuesday and
and every other vendor has a uh, you know frequent rollout of a device, and every time you start your web browser, there's a little pop-up message that says, "Oh, there's a new release. Please restart this." And uh, and you know if you keep track of all of these updates, you essentially can get one every few hours um, for you know for, for a system that you are running. The reason that we're constantly updating and changing um, software is because we don't know how to get it right the first time. And when you add the uh, complexity into the security system, that essentially means we don't know how to secure the device. So that's the nightmare that, that, that I'm foreseeing if the FBI gets what it wants. So I just, we need to illustrate that with a specific case of Apple. Now, Apple's particular exploit, the way that they were previously able to compromise some of the information stored in the file protection done in class on their devices, um, did at least require Apple's developer key. Uh, and so uh, that's not that that's necessarily great from a security perspective, but, but what you can, I guess, say about the risk in this case is, look, if Apple's developer key is compromised, um, probably uh, access to encrypted data on the stored device uh, by a physical access is going to be the least of your problems if you're an iPhone owner. Um, however, the other issue here is because, uh, as Matt says, you cannot always predict how a complex system is going to function. There are lots of things you're not supposed to be able to do on an iPhone without the developer key, like uh, you know, jailbreak it. As it turns out, uh, lots of things that you're not supposed to be able to do on the phone without the developer key, uh, people have found ways to do on the phone even without the developer key. Um, so it's not just, as, as Matt said, the risk of the secret being compromised, but the risk of in a complex system, people finding ways to uh, uh, work around the edges of what that secret is supposed to live in. Uh, and, and of course, this is sort of some, a model that works almost uniquely for Apple, right? They've got this soup to nuts model. Uh, they control the horizontal, they control the vertical, they build the chips, they write the software that runs on it, and in theory, uh, exclusively approve the software running on it. Unless you want all devices to work on the Apple model, uh, the manufacturer or software maker has a secret um, is, is probably not going to be viable. So you conquered the second thing that Matt said. The first thing he said was the problem of secrets. And I think we've all been bombarded over the last 18 months with the government's failure to keep a secret. Uh, but Julian, you study this every single day. Do you want to say a few words about what you think their ability is to keep secrets and how mm -hmm. you think that may or may not be able to play out? Right. Well, I mean, ideally, um, yeah, you, you wouldn't have, at least you wouldn't have the government in, in charge of the secrets. They'd be sending it to Apple, which is perhaps a little bit uh, better from a civil liberties perspective. Um, but yeah, obviously, um, you know, it was unthinkable that any data from the hyper-secure uh, um, caches at NSA could be compromised until a guy walked out with a couple uh, thousand uh, classified documents. Um, and it's also important to know that the more the security of devices depends on a centralized secret, the more attractive a target for attack that is, right? When we talk about security, security is always relative to your threat model, right? My house has you know, an alarm system and a lock on the door. It's adequate security for my home. It would not be adequate security for Fort Knox. Um, and so if you have devices that manufacturers are trying to keep, not just Apple, but everyone who's designing software for a device uh, or you know, designing the device itself, is required to keep a secret that, if compromised, will unlock and provide access to every device they make, um, then the value of that secret to an attacker hoping to exfiltrate the secret is much greater mm -hmm. than if that key is of no value unless you also have the individual user's passcode. The question is, are you more tempted to attack a system that's going to provide you with a skeleton key mm -hmm. to every device that company makes? Um, or, uh, or a skeleton key or you know, a secret key um, that actually is not any use to you unless you also have the individual user's uh, self-generated passcode. Uh, and obviously one of those is a much more attractive target for attackers. Right. And I think you know, I mean, one, one question you have to ask is you know, how many uh, you know, People's Liberation Army or um, you know, FSB or pick your favorite um, Less than completely friendly nation state. You know, spies are there who are working at Google and Apple and you know other companies that we may not uh, even be thinking about. How hard is it to get a job? Uh, you know, that will give you access to one of these keys, given the resources of a of an intelligence agency. Yeah. I mean, it's important to emphasize that when we talk about malicious attackers, and we're not just talking about some kid in a 4chan chat room with a guy fox mask. Right. Um, we're talking about 
Uh, very Although they, they're pretty successful. They're, they're also pretty <laughs> successful. Um, but we're, we're, we're also talking about um, devices being used uh, by major corporations to store really valuable intellectual property, information about corporate activities um, that is absolutely, uh, potentially, you know, extremely valuable to both rival corporations uh, and uh, foreign intelligence services of sophistication, probably almost equivalent to that of our own. Uh, intelligence agencies, and so uh, we need uh, we need security that is uh, robust in the face of that kind of attacker. And it's a different kind of victim too, because we're talking about people in the U.S. companies in the U.S. But the same devices that Apple sells to the people in this room, they're also selling to people in um, Turkey, people in Mexico, sure. people in China. So any right. vulnerability that's built in here is going to be exported around the world. I mean, there's an incredible tension between um, the, I guess, sort of the public-facing kind of campaign by the U.S. State Department uh, to promote internet freedom and indeed to promote tools for privacy and anonymity. I mean, the U.S. government is the major funder for a long time of Tor, uh, and it's, uh, in other ways sponsors and promotes uh, various encryption and anonymity services around the globe. Uh, certainly, the FBI's own sort of web page will recommend that you use device encryption on your phone. Um, to say on the one hand that we're going to promote that, that we're going to recognize this as, as something of enormous value to people living under repressive regimes, and at the same time, we're going to ensure that any device they buy from an American company comes pre-owned for the convenience of that repressive regime's intelligence services is, I think, a totally untenable position. Yeah. It, you know, it, it's also... Um talking about creating an architectural precedent and perhaps architectural hooks for government backdoors that can be emulated by other governments. If, you know, if a standard design architecture for new applications and new hardware devices uh, includes the government access mechanism, um, you know, it's probably worth remembering that it is extremely unlikely that your phone has been made entirely in the United States and that that's the only uh, government that might uh, exert some influence over what backdoors might be in it. So a backdoor-free uh, internet is uh, probably a much uh, more desirable thing from a U.S. national security uh, point of view. So we have a question, but we have two. So I just want to question um, sort of the premise of the of the debate. So obviously it's been a huge groundswell. Yeah. It's, it's quite the debate. We're really yeah, you know, it's right. We're right. really <laughs> really yeah. Uh, so obviously it's been a huge groundswell in response to Director Comey coming out and saying Apple's acting to protect pedophiles and criminals of all stripes, and that's a conscious decision on their part. Um, so I have sort of two questions for you three. The first is: Is it technically so that much easier for law enforcement to go after mobile devices than it is to the cloud services that that data is talking to or to any sort of off-site storage. Um, the second question is, again, for all three, is it legally substantially easier for them to target end-user devices rather than any centralized storage mechanism, whether it's Apple or iCloud or any third party? Yeah, I mean, so legally, certainly, they have a much easier time. In general, especially since the uh, Supreme Court's ruling in Riley of California, um, in general, to physically seize from you your and search the contents of your mobile device, um, law enforcement would require a, a search warrant uh, issued by a, a neutral magistrate and meeting the Fourth Amendment standard of probable cause and particularity. Um, to obtain many, many types of cloud stored data, they would require only a, a subpoena or a, something called a 2703D order, which uh, would be issued by a court, but uh, employ a much lower standard of proof, the, uh, uh, the beloved relevance that we've all become so familiar with thanks to the uh, NSA's uh, 215 bulk telephony program. Um, so yeah, from a legal perspective, and indeed from a, a, I think a practical perspective, it's often a lot easier to serve a subpoena on a telephone company of known address than to kind of go in physically to a house and sort of seize a bunch of phones, especially if you're talking, I mean, okay, devices, uh, uh, investigations where de devices and communications contact um, our critical evidence are, I mean, occasionally it might be kind of the lone uh, you know, pedophile or, or, or other kind of violent criminal, but um, you know, very often it'll be drug gangs, uh, crimes involving conspiracy. So if you've got a list of suspects, going around and trying to collect every one of their devices is going to be um, a much trickier uh, affair than going with a subpoena to Apple and saying, all right, we, these are the 20 accounts we want uh, uh, iCloud information for. You know, 
in terms of getting at the content of communications, a lot of companies are still going to demand uh, a Fourth Amendment search warrant before they hand that over. But very often, that's actually not the most important part of the puzzle. Often, it's when did this communicate? You know, when did you communicate with who, and what was the pattern of communications that followed? That may be enough to make your case. Um, just a couple things I'll add on um, is that it is harder to get a device, as Julian mentioned. Um, we're not, I'm not totally sure we're sure how the March exceptions are going to play out to Riley, since it is such a new case. There are going to be a lot of issues, and specifically probably on the border. So there are going to be issues where it is easier to get access to the device. Um, and there was recently a court decision that isn't right on point, but you had to think there are a lot of layers to what you need. So first you need the device itself, and you need to be able to compel, and then you need to get into the device. So they talked about how with Apple's also new fingerprint access, that they can compel you to provide your fingerprint in a way they can't compel you to provide a typed in password. So if people have an Apple device and have, are using the fingerprint access, that that is not a, a problem to compel somebody to put their finger on the keypad and to give access to the device. So uh, let me answer a slightly different question than you asked, and hope you I hope you won't notice. Um, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have tipped my hand. Um, the um, you know I, as a from a technical point of view, uh, there are two properties of these mobile devices that I think are important to remember. The first is that you know these mobile devices just create an enormous amount of data that just didn't exist without them. So one of the reasons that I think we see a law enforcement focus on you know, phones and other other portable electronics that uh, that uh, you can carry around with you is that you know these are a source of data that just you know without them would not otherwise uh, exist. You know if you go back 20 years before you know people were carrying around uh, their phones, law enforcement went to other mechanisms to get uh, the, the the same sorts of evidence. So this is. Um, you know, this is brand new data that just would not otherwise have existed. It's things like, you know, where where you've been, what you've been texting, what notes you've been taking, who your contacts are, you know, what you think is important, what you've chosen to save versus uh, what you've chosen to delete, uh, and you know that 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 just goes so far beyond you know written diaries or notes or pocket litter that you might have had. It's kind of a one-stop shopping device for, for what a, 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 a person has been thinking of. So I think it's pretty natural that that, that, that would be something that investigators would find extremely interesting. Uh, the second is that um, you know I have absolutely no confidence in our ability as a field, our technical ability, to protect these devices against a serious targeted um, um, uh, effort at compromising them, whether that's by law enforcement or, or by uh, by anyone else. Uh, I think you know mass scale um, uh, surveillance. We know how to design things using encryption technology and using you know smart types of communication architecture, like peer to peer um, communication, that can make large scale surveillance difficult. But even if Apple um, you know, removes the explicit backdoors, and even if there's no, um, you know, known way to get in, it, uh, it it would shock me if the resources of, say, the FBI and the uh, and the um, national uh, intelligence agencies didn't know how to compromise um, one of the, one of these handsets uh, through other means. In fact, one of the things we learned from the Snowden uh, documents. Is that the catalog? You know, I call it the spy mall catalog that was um, uh, that was leaked uh, as part of the Snowden documents last year. Included some pretty impressive uh, technologies, precisely aimed at compromising mobile phone handsets in ways that went well beyond what you know is no widely known publicly. And that was dated from 2007. So this was you know. Um, uh, it was quite old at the time. It's only gotten better. When the FBI director, you know, I, I, I have to wonder when the FBI director said, Apple doing this is closing us out of iPhones, if what, if the message he really intended to send was, hey, criminals, 
<laughs> uh, oh no, don't throw us in the briar patch by using an iPhone. That would just be terrible. That's going to shut us down and we won't be able to catch you. Wink, wink. Yeah. One, one suspects. I gotta say, I, I'm reminded by these going dark complaints of that old Louis C.K. routine where he talks about sitting next to someone on a plane who's complaining, oh, this in flight Wi Fi is really slow and I can't get YouTube. And you know, Louis going, you're flying through the air, connecting to a global <laughs> network of information. Stop complaining. You know, um, the, the, the number of different streams of data and the variety of investigative tools uh, to which I mean, even ordinary law enforcement now have access, uh, a quantity of data that would have been just unimaginable in 1985 would have sent you know, an ordinary investigator into sort of transports of Orwellian glee as this kind of unimaginable <laughs> treasure trove. Uh, of personal data to be exploited, to now be complaining that in this sort of one narrow way they might have to go get a quarter order to compel a password, or you know, this one way of accessing data is closed. Is I mean, I think uh, what, what we on, on Twitter would call a hashtag first world problem uh, in the in the purest sense. So Orwellian glee; <laughs> those are two words you don't normally hear. Uh, uh, so, okay, so my college band. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, as soon as Comey started this debate, I sort of had the feeling I'd like, seen this movie before. Is this just a rehash of the Clifford Schiff debates from the Clinton administration? Is that a fair characterization? I, I, I think it's actually more expansive than that, but you know, yes, we have heard these arguments before. Um, you know, it, it, by comparison, uh, the Clipper uh, uh, debate was much, much narrower. Um, it was, you know, it was specifically focused on encryption, and I think this is broader than encryption. But, you know, it's the same, the argument is of the same form. The argument was, well, not quite today, but any day now, we're about to go dark. The technology is allowed to proceed along the uh, uh, path that it's currently on. And, you know, it's very interesting because we can do the experiment in retrospect. We can look back and we can notice that, well, you know, the government, uh, the FBI lost the clipper chip debate and technology did move on. And in fact, we have, uh, you know, an enormous amount of unrestricted crypto um, out there. And, you know, lo and behold, they didn't go dark. So they were, you know, they made a claim that demonstrably was proven wrong the last time around. And I think that perhaps should inform uh, some skepticism this time around. Will, will it eventually, will that argument eventually be right? I mean, I, so in the, 20 years? Will... I, I think that's a good question. And, you know, I mean, I think, first of all, for that argument to be, for that argument to be proven right, a few things have to happen. Um, the first thing is that we have to become um, enormously successful at deploying cryptography genuinely from end to end and protecting um, data that we currently don't know how to protect, metadata, data about your communication, is much, much harder to protect than content. And it's much more useful in an investigation. In an investigation, what we see being used in, in investigations is often pen register data, communications metadata, rather than content. Um, and we largely don't know how to protect that in general. So um, the first thing is we need to be very successful at protecting not just content, but this other stuff. And perhaps, you know, uh, um, uh, and perhaps we'll be able to do that. Um, but there, there'd be some, you know, a lot has to happen in order to get there. Um, secondly, um, we need, we need to become very, very successful at protecting computers against targeted attacks. And frankly, that's a problem we've been working on for a long time, and you know that's what we're making negative progress against. So even if we are successful at figuring out how to protect with encryption and other technologies, uh, things against um, large-scale attacks in the communication infrastructure, um, I, I don't see any future in which um, short of a, a miracle that could happen, um, we're going to be able to protect uh, handsets against the resources of a government. You mind, by the way, I had a conversation recently with Stuart Baker, former DHS official, former NSA general counsel. Uh, I you know, approached this and said, look, we've been predicting the apocalypse forever. Um, and he said, you know, well, this is the problem. We were too prescient. We saw too far ahead. <laughs> it's our curse. 
like a, like a Cassandra, I suppose. Is there other questions from out here? So I'm going to make a little bit of a stretch, and I want you guys to tell me how possible this is. So there are a lot of proposals being announced in different countries to localize data retention or data storage. And they really want to take, in response to serial revelations and other things, data outside of the US and mandate, for example, that Brazil's data, data about people from Brazil, is stored in Brazil. Um, same with Russia, same with a lot of other countries. Could we see proposals in the next five years if this becomes some sort of policy in the US where devices or parts of devices that are sold internally have to be manufactured? Um, because that won't only be a um, potential end run around and FBI um, backdoors or law enforcement backdoors, but also a boon to local economies if they're you know, opening up all of these um, factories to manufacture devices. Is this a potential solution for other countries? And what would that do to local governments? Is it just other countries spying on their own people in different ways? So I guess you know, there are the, the, these localization requirements seem to be driven at least explicitly by concerns about foreign spying uh, mm -hmm. on um, citizens of, of a country. You know, particularly the NSA revelations uh, from Snowden. You know, revealed that the U.S. is involved in, in quite a bit of foreign uh, intelligence abroad. And part of the reason the NSA is so successful is a lot of data is stored in the U.S. Um, you know, unfortunately, the reason that a lot of data is stored in the US is that the internet has evolved to be kind of a global thing. It works well because, you know, you, you precisely because you don't have to impose particular routes that data takes and you don't, you can locate data centers in various places and you can move data around very, very quickly. So I think, you know, it, it is true that it would, you know, it, Perhaps it would be nice for Luxembourg to have a, uh, you know, to have a cell phone manufacturing industry um, located there, and another one in in, uh, in in Belgium, and another one perhaps in, in Portugal, and you know, another one in Brazil. Um, and you know, maybe that would be a boon to the uh, local economy. Although there'd probably be some environmental uh, impact uh, 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 there there as well. You know, this is going to essentially make technology enormously expensive and you know more vulnerable to a thousand different local um, uh, attacks so I'm, I'm I'm skeptical of, of, of this scenario and I, I, I see a lot more downside than upside and but, you know Missouri make its own cell phones and, and Nebraska make its own cell phones and then all of their economies with boom and crap I mean I think we've learned you know if anything uh, over the past couple centuries that, that uh, um, in general, at least, uh, forbidding trade is not a kind of awesome uh, magic recipe for prosperity. So we're seeing in the U.S. policy solutions, we saw in the House what we call the massey Lofgren Amendment, attached to the appropriations bill, and it basically was the anti-Kalia II. It prohibited the use of funding to build in backdoors of vulnerabilities into software or hardware. Um, Julian and maybe Matt, you want to weigh in on this also. Do you see this as something that could also pass in the Senate, or become law in some other form, this kind of, not only are we defeating Kalia 2 year by year by not getting Kalia 2, but some sort of affirmative, not only are we not going to pass this law, but we're going to prohibit this practice from taking place. Okay, so I, I, I don't do these sort of the, the nose counting part, so I'm not going to speculate on its probability of passing. I think it's a slightly different and sort of narrower prohibition. It's the one I'm thinking of, you're talking about the Prohibition on NSA consulting with NIST in violation no, no, no. of things like this is different. That was um, Grayson law. Oh, that's Grayson, right? Um, this was a prohibition on using appropriations yeah. right. to so, build in vulnerabilities. Right. Um, I, mean, I imagine that also is, is about sort of. Uh, well, that's slightly different because this, when we're imagining that being some stuff they, they're doing kind of covertly as opposed to a kind of public re-architecture mandate. Um, but um, it serves very much, I think, the same purpose, right? Which is um, we know that in the global marketplace, American companies are now far less trusted. I, I've read that uh, Cisco has seen a, a precipitous drop in their 
uh, foreign orders, chiefly from China, a variety of other countries ever since um, uh, the, uh, I think the Intercept ran, a, or maybe the British Beagle ran a photo uh, of NSA technicians sort of opening up a, a Cisco router package to be shipped to some foreign corporation, installing malware, and then boxing it up again to uh, send along. As it turns out, people in foreign countries and, and uh, the security uh, personnel who, uh, at uh, large foreign corporations um, are disinclined to um, uh, buy uh, products that they think come preloaded with malware. Um, and so if you don't want to, again, put a, a kind of bullet in the head of, of the U.S. Uh, the software and, and, and technology manufacturing who needs some kind of uh, assurance to the global market that they're not buying deliberately broken, deliberately root-kitted uh, um, products. Yeah. Any final questions? So I wanted to let you guys have final remarks, um, wrap up a little early and let the audience have um, beer and wine, which we're going to have at front after this is over. Um, but do you have any last things to say? Um, looking forward, always looking forward and seeing where the technology is going um, to give a slight prompt. Matt, if you can talk about what maybe people can do um, to encourage the use of these type of technologies, um, not only today, but you know, a year from now, five years from now. So I think one of the things that, that uh, one of the ways in which my field has has failed is to make uh, encryption technology uh, as usable as it could be. Um, you know, there are some um, applications in which it's fairly transparent, but in general, um, uh, uh, encryption is hard to use um, and it's uh, hard to configure and it's hard to know whether you're using it correctly. Um, so I think one of the, the important things to do is to first of all, you know, first of all, start using it to protect um, to protect your data. You know, turn on security features and get in the habit of of trying to find how how to make encryption usable. You know, for you, that's a, a sort of individual thing you can do. Uh, to become aware of what some of the technical issues are. More importantly, you know, we've got to encourage uh, vendors and software developers and hardware developers to, you know, include usable security features that are on by default, um, and you know, have there be demand for this as something that you know, customers believe add value. And I think you know, over time, you know, I over the course of my career, we went from security and and uh, data protection being something that you had to make a case for and explain to people why this was important. You don't have to do that anymore, but we've still got a long way to go to, to making this, um, you know, something that uh, it is is considered a priority in, in our infrastructure. Just real quick to follow up on that, Matt. Do you have any resources that you would guide people to? And well, you know, encrypt all the things. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a, a, a good one. And, and, and indeed, if you uh, are uh, in town on December 12th, uh, we'll be having a, the Cato Institute's inaugural surveillance conference, um, which uh, will end with a sort of crypto reception. Um, so if you're interested in learning how to use encryption technology, um, we will have an array of experts, uh, I think, uh, led by the inimitable uh, Mr. Stanovich, uh, to teach you how to use to tools like Tor and encrypted email and uh, OTR encrypted chat. And, and if you're not interested in that, you can come anyway and, and drink beer. Any other final remarks? Hack the planet. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we do have, I think, a great website up where the campaign under which we are hosting this series is Encrypt All the Things at EncryptAllTheThings.net, where we're trying to peer pressure companies into offering better encryption standards for users and trying to develop and utilize tools that will protect all of your communications. So if you're interested, also our second conference, I will put one more plug in, is the day before the Cato Surveillance Conference. Um, and we'll let you know where that's going to be when we have a location. But thank you all for coming out. Um, the reception is going to be in the other kitchen in this on this floor. Um, so if you wrap around over here to the left and follow, you'll see everything set out for you guys. Thank you.